Okay, full disclosure, he's the last main presenter of the day, but uh, there's been a lot of friends uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, symposium today. And we started with the Michael Mostyn and West Hall, but Fodney Emmy is, uh, uh, I am proud to be his brother in arms. When we've talked through much of this day on racism, and even I put the questions to Metro Landry, who's terrific, and she, you know she, she's, a, she's the chair of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, but the question to Peter Flagel, who runs his own project within the federal government, you know, who do you call? Like, who are you gonna call? You got a racism problem, who are you gonna call? You call Phony Emmy and Crar. Uh, Phony Emmy uh, is co-founder and executive director of the Center for Research Action on Race Relations. It's a nonprofit. It's an incredibly important civil rights organization. If it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. His background is a social worker. He's been doing this for decades, and he's so bloody effective. And if there's a problem with somebody, a uh, Middle Eastern girl gets a ticket for sitting on a bench. Black taxi drivers get ticketed for pulling their cars over and, and going in and using a washroom. Uh, minorities of color, people who are driving cars that are, we talked about this earlier with, with Wes and, and Michael, uh, and are pulled over because the car looks, looks too, too good for them. There's one call they make. It's the phony Emmy, who's not only an important community resource because he's there, but he's so damned effective. And if you, some of you who've been with us in the, in the morning, if you remember when I asked Peter Flagel, who heads the strategy group against racism within uh, the federal government, I said, P uh, Peter, there's, you know, you got it. If Carr calls you and they want you to sit there at one of their press conferences, as I've done, that creates a fact on the ground. Are you ready to sit and not just talk? Well, here's the man who creates facts on the ground and gets justice every day of the week. Uh, my dear friend and brother, Phony Emmy. How are you, Phil? Thank you very much. All, uh, all true. And Pho will be talking about racial profiling, which of course is a problem we have, not fully addressed with all the reforms. Thank you very much. Uh, how, how long do I have since I'm the last uh, you, speaker? You've got a half hour. 25 okay, minutes. Fine. Now I'll try to do it. 20 okay, minutes, fine. whatever I'll you go, like. I'll try to go, go. And then we'll go into a Q&A. As simple as possible. Well, first of all, thank you very much um, to, to, um, for having invited me to this uh, session today. I just would like to possibly share with you a thing or two about some of the things that we're doing and also some of the issues that are uh, relevant to us with regard to racial profiling and the kind of work that we do in dealing with anti-racism. Um, you, you may know that uh, based on the, your introduction is that we've been working on this uh, issue of racism and in those days they didn't call it racial profiling but they called it something else uh, but essentially it was the same. So I'd just like to maybe to walk through with you with some of the things that we have been involved with uh, over the years. But before doing that, I'd just like to quote a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, it's basically a social movement that not only moves people is merely a revolt. A movement that changes people and institutions is a revolution. And it's something that I always believe in. I have uh, always uh, tried to keep this in the deep in my heart because of uh, changing people and changing institutions and changing public policy. It's not just about basically stand up there and yell and cry and march and the, you know, but basically seeking change. So I'll, one of the things that we are, um, we could all talk about racial profiling without talking about the broad issue of racism. I just want to bring to you some of the issues that come to our organization in terms of the rank of priorities for us. Believe it or not, the top issue for us, the number of people who come to us to help is racism in employment, particularly in unionized workplaces and in education in schools. The second issue that uh, people come to see us often is about lack of access to justice and to effective protection for victim of discrimination. Basically, many of us uh, institutions don't work and are not accessible for people who are victim of discrimination. More recently, we're facing the rise of COVID-19 anti-Asian -race racism, which in many ways is a form of racial profiling based on people who, look, who are or who look Asian. And of course, racial profiling by the police, or law enforcement uh, the services. And lastly, the issue that, believe it or not, again, that really sort of hits home to 
Many of us, it's the whole issue of anger from exclusion from public institution. Many, often these issues intersect and they are so interconnected and interdependent that it's uh, very difficult for us to separate them. So, but I'd like to talk more about this situation of racial profiling. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a new issue, it's not a new phenomenon. It dates back to way from the 70s. You, some of you may recall enough, uh, may be old enough to recall the uh, public inquiry into racism in the Montreal taxi industry in 1982. It was the first public inquiry into racism of the, of the kind that we know in which the issue of police abuse and systematic violation of the civil rights of taxi drivers, most of whom are, are, were uh, Haitian, uh, at the time, uh, it was doing this public inquiry that the issue came to light. And it was uh, then in 2002, some of the um, years passed before we set up a task force, a community-based task force on racial profiling, as a result of a lot of interception and fines and arrests in Montreal, a result of some changes in the Montreal Transit Authority policy. And then in 2002, a series of civil rights complaints of profiling in a public housing area in Saint Michel, which is in the East End of Montreal, and those are the key uh, actions that help uh, spur a government movement to uh, define and five it was in the six through the work of um, many people, including and in particularly through the work of lawyer Michel Turenne, that the Quebec Human Rights Commission ended up with the official definition of racial profiling. So in other words, since then things have changed, especially since 2005, when the first uh, court decision in Quebec on racial profiling came down from Judge Juanita Juan Westmoreland Traoré in a criminal case. Um, so racial profiling increasingly now has been recognized. What is racial profiling? It's a term that is being used rather liberally by a lot of people. Uh, here, I just want to take the opportunity to redefine it, to clarify it, because sometimes uh, it's uh, a very complex uh, concept that even judges and lawyers have problems with. The Quebec Human Rights Commission defined the racial profiling as being any action taken by one or more people in authority with respect to a person or group of persons for reasons of safety, security, and public order that is based on uh, things race without factual grounds or a reasonable suspicion that results in a person or group being exposed the differential treatment or scrutiny. As you can see in this definition, there are many elements that are essential to a, a fundamental definition of what racial profiling is. So in some circumstances that we've seen, um, an incident may not be uh, racial profiling because it may lack many of these definitional elements, but people call it racial profiling anyway. And I just wanted to point out this, some of these uh, the elements of a definition because it can help us better understand the dynamics of a of incident of racial profiling, what it is and what it's not. Now, the um, uh, racial profiling is basically the definition was upheld. This definition was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2015. Um, and it's also known in many cases of being driving or walking or shopping while black. Uh, for the members of the Arab and Muslim community, at one point it was flying while Muslim, when there was a lot of association of Muslim with, with terrorism that led to travel bans. And for many uh, Chinese scientists working in some position, especially the immigrants from mainland China, uh, racial profiling and employment for members of the Chinese community uh, who are scientists or wish to work as scientists and inside uh, they tend to be perceived as possible spy for their foreign Chinese government uh, and who will steal uh, either state or industry secrets to sell to the government of China. Uh, we need to remember the racial profiling is not only about the police but it also happens in employment and in housing and in the education, so on and so forth. Uh, we believe that there are three causes of uh, racial profiling, one of which is overt racism. 
there's a deliberate slinging out, singling out uh, specific groups of harsher and more negative treatments. This is deliberate, intentional acts of uh, racism. There's an issue of unconscious stereotyping, either because of the law enforcement officer or the person in authority acts out in un unconscious or subconscious racial bias. Or thirdly, it's for efficiency. In the eyes of some authorities, some groups are more involved in crime. Therefore, the authorities need to devote more resources to, and target these groups. Now, in terms of the effects, we know that one, there are many things uh, that can result from an incident of racial profiling that's very bad for the communities affected. But the most important is criminalization, it, because often it can lead to criminal charges. It can lead to insurmountable legal costs and uh, having a criminal records, and then that can have serious repercussion for employment or travel to the United States later on. So what do we do about racial profiling in a city like Montreal? I have, um, I believe there are three challenges, one of which is some, sometimes the challenge overcoming an attitude whereby racial profiling is seen as a way of life. People say that, look, it's c'est la vie, let's cope with it, let's deal with it. It's a quiet acceptance of a problem that befalls the community. There's also the problem that we see very often, the, the fact that many people lack proper information to act fast. They don't know about the rights, they don't know about the recourses, and more importantly, they don't know about the deadline to uh, take action and sometimes people come to see us even one or two days too late to do anything about uh, recourses. And then there's a third problem that we see increasingly is that the in ineffective protection of victims of racial profiling. Often public protection agencies are not accessible for victims. There are systemic barriers such as excessive delays, uh, willful resistance to the notion of racism or systemic racism, and more often it's just plain ignorance, just authority just don't know how to understand it, how to frame it, how to detect it, and how to present it. I would like to speak on the issue of excessive delays. Earlier, Barrow mentioned a case of, um, I think it's well publicized, I can mention her name, of that uh, Arab student of Concordia who in 2010 was roughed up in downtown Montreal uh, because of a clear case of racial profiling. We filed a complaint with the Quebec Human Rights Commission in 2010. It took the commission 88 months to investigate and to bring the case to the Human Rights Tribunal. And in the end, last August, the Human Rights Tribunal threw out the case, uh, blaming the commission for excessive delays, causing, among other things, considerable um, failure in the administration of justice for this woman. And therefore, this woman practically lost her right to an effective protection against racial discrimination. And we are facing right now with several other challenges of excessive delays in cases of racial profiling. And this is uh, some very, very something that many people don't talk about, but which I believe it's an essential to any discussion on racial profiling in the city. Basically, the system does not work the way it's supposed to work, and there seems to be no one held accountable for, among other things, the excessive delays. In the private sector, the CEOs can get fired, the board can get removed, uh, VPs can get dislodged, but in the public sector, none of those things can happen even if you don't do your job right. So in the end, what I'm saying to say is racial profiling and racism in general, we need to be fought by everyone because sooner or later we're all affected by it. And one way to be affected is that when racial profiling litigation, lawsuits or complaints uh, m mount, it's rep they represent a lot of costs to all of us, individual costs, community costs, but also costs to taxpayers because the money that public administration have to spend in defending themselves against racial profiling lawsuit, that's basically your tax dollars and my tax dollars, and we will want to have greater accountability on the part of police department and city administration and other public agencies to show and tell the amount of money that are being spent in defending themselves against lawsuits of racial discrimination. I would like to end by saying that, uh, you know, to, for some of us, our parents and grandparents, for the 
security of the person. So once again, I come back to the need to create a movement to change policies, people's institutions, because that's where things can change and things can be improved. So I would like to end there and uh, entertain any questions or comments uh, people may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fo and Bruce. If you could just clear out the uh, the, uh, the those those screen things, Bruce. Oh, Bruce is muted. Fo, can you close your uh, PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Uh, before I, I I take a look at the questions that have come in because we 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 have a good amount of time. We have about fifteen minutes. Uh, I want to just point out, I want to ask you a question and I want to point out to, uh, to the attendees. Uh, there's always something that whenever you've taken on racial profiling, whenever I've editorialized against racial profiling, you always get a police officer. So, you know, you're, you're bothering about this racial profiling. And that means that if we get a description of somebody who, uh, who uh, that a part of the description of a robber, for example, this is the, this is the example they always give me. If we get a description of a robber who robbed a depreneur and part of the description is black, you guys have pumped up racial profiling so much, we can't even stop a black man. But that's not what racial profiling is, is it, folks? No, it's not. What we're saying, you know, the problem of good circulating a vague race-based suspect description is a very commonly identified in the United States. And there are guidelines being developed in many American jurisdictions in order to continue to provide a suspect description uh, and not fall into creating a false racial um, stereotyping of, of form of racial profiling that allow police officers to cast a white net. We have so many cases of basically innocent black men uh, whose only uh, reason for suspicion of, and for being detained and arrested sometimes violently is because they're male and black. Uh, there's no other description of age group, for example, to which they belong or height and weight or other physical characteristics that can help narrow down the su suspect description and avoid uh, casting a white net on people simply because of the race and gender. And, and you know, what we've been advocating for, and sadly, the federal government has actually weakened this, but when Fo is talking about what we've, what we've been advocating for, what we write about is, fine, if you have to stop people of a certain description, okay, but you need reasonable cause to stop that particular person. You can't just stop them because they're black or they're Asian or whatever. There's gotta be some real other relation besides their, their race. And uh, I can't get out of my mind after all these years, Fo, not only the case of Amal Asmar, uh, who was the, the girl you were talking about, but uh, you know, the case of Rowan Wilson, who was walking home, a conservatively dressed young man, 35 years old. There had been a, there had been a robbery at a local day penner. Squad car pulled up, handcuffed him. He was dead 24 hours later in police custody. We still don't have a coroner's inquest into it. But that, that, that's what goes on. But certainly for all of you who are viewing this, Foe is not advocating that information cannot be used what he's advocating for is that it must be used with reasonable cause, with just cause. There's got to be uh, some lien avec les faits. Uh, Professor Stephen defour wire uh, fo asks you, could you speak to the benefit of increased racial diversity in institutions? Well, I think your screen... Well, look, tomorrow we're going to go public with a... Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, we we're going to go public with a motion introduced by Council, Council Marvin Rotron about the need to have more uh, racial minorities running for city council and getting elected in districts throughout the city in order to ensure that our city council reflects the diversity of this city. I think diversity is an added value, if not an essential ingredient for sound and common sense policy making. We cannot have a basically a it's, uh, I call it uh, the fact of racial disconnect between the people and those they elect govern or to represent them. And unfortunately in Montreal, we still lack the, the diversity representation uh, at City Hall and in many other levels of government, uh, particularly in the provincial government where you know Montreal is, it does not have a seat uh, except for one in cabinet. And you know, and also it's not only the, in the public sector, I want to point to the fact that many of our corporate wardrooms 
uh, our labor union executives are still very disconnected from the racial and the changing demographic um, and all the forms of diversity of the population. It's about catching up to reality and developing common sense solutions to what is essentially a fundamental problem and challenge of governance, whether in the public or the private sector. I'm not a big fan of affirmative action, as you know, per se, but I can remember your reaction, my reaction several years ago, when our current police chief was introduced and Mayor Plant said, well, I don't think it's a big problem that he doesn't speak or understand English. This is for a city that 50.3% of the population is non-Francophone. That was quite a moment. Well, you know, that's right. It's not only the police, uh, I think that when we talk about, uh, for example, racial profiling, you know, even the youth protection or social service agencies, the board of directors, I mean, the social service agency just don't reflect the very patients or the service users they're supposed to help. Uh, so there again, the disconnect, I think that's a question of race, it's a question of class. There's also, it comes down to the issue of governance and democracy. You cannot uh, govern or you cannot make sound policy when the people you want to make policies for or policies with are not around the decision-making table. And that's the kind of mindset we need to change at the top. Court boardroom have undertaken all kinds of uh, measures in, to increase gender representation and the present women in key decision-making uh, positions in the private sector and then in the public sector, in the judiciary. But you know, when it comes to racial diversity, we still have a couple of kilometers to go and we hope to speed things up, uh, hopefully you know, with a greater participation in elections and other means of challenging decisions. To, for example, we, last year we, we pointed out that in many municipal boards and commission in this very own city, anglophones are completely absent from the board of directors. So sometimes I ask the question, why do some of our decision makers have such a, something so negative about getting more anglophone represented and participating on boards of public agencies uh, that are supported by their tax dollars? And, and uh, all of, everybody listening and, and viewing should know Foe, and, and I applaud him for this, and certainly I agree with him, has a broader definition. Uh, I think he uses the word discrimination as much as he uses the word racism. I know racism is in the title of our symposium today, but when he's, the reason he's bringing up language and culture is because you can take our word for it from decades of work. Discrimination based on anything, language, obviously it's more obvious based on skin color or physical features, but discrimination based on language is discrimination. Uh, don't, there's no two ways about it. It may take longer to affect everybody, but it affects everybody. Yvonne, as on that well, point, is asking, sorry, Fofo. No, yes. in our work, uh, we apply the gender analysis. We recognize uh, the, you know, the, the, how women experience racial discrimination very differently. We recognize that people with disabilities who are also people of color experience different hardship very differently. So it's a matter of reflecting uh, reality and reflecting what we call the basic humanity of the people who encounter barriers and who come to seek uh, help and who deserve to be helped with full dignity and, to, and be taken into consideration in their totality. Uh, on that point, and it'll be the final question, Yvonne asked, would you say that we've made progress regarding fighting, regarding the fight against racism in Montreal? Uh, it's one step forward and two steps backward. Uh, we have, we, we can't even, talk, even but steps, we don't we can't walk even the do, walk as we can't much. even do it the other way, two steps forward and one step back? No, we don't, because there were all kinds of reasons we can step. So I think we but don't walk. Talk as if we, except we use the right terminology, but it comes to changing people, changing institutions, as Martin Luther King said, we haven't got there yet. And why is because it's still too many people are excluded from a movement to change. And I, as we cannot fight race in this city when half of the most, half the population who are English speaking being left out, regardless of ethnic background. It's a lopsided, uh, top-down look at the discrimination and achieve equality. We have more of an intersectional, holistic, and mutually interdependent way of looking at 
removing barriers to participation and exclusion. And this is why we want to recognize even Francophones, uh, Quebecois, who are disabled and all that. It's part of our concern too, because you know it's about removing systemic discrimination for specific groups who, that have specific needs and that have a very, very specific aspirations to belong and to be first class citizens. Well, I wanted to ask you something, and I brought this up both with the uh, Canadian Human Rights Commissioner Landry and, and uh, uh, Peter Flagel from the federal government and others. Of this creating a fact on the ground, you, you're superb at using media. I mean, it, I, I'll never get your setting out of the mind. There you are, every time there's a case at the desk, surrounded by your colleagues and the plaintiffs with the plants and the crowd banner, and that's become iconic. Uh, you use media so well, and you're not afraid to get an issue out there. How come so many other organizations, so many other people involved in this, they, they shy away from taking it out there, from taking it to the streets? I remember the first time you and I met, it was, you know, you very openly are covering, saying, look, you gotta, you got to write something about this. It helps the person. It helps the cause. And you're a master at it. And there are a lot of people who are afraid of that. Yes, you know, I, I had my first uh, lessons in an advocacy at Project Genesis, advocating for the poor, empowering the poor, empowering the voiceless, seniors who are too afraid. That was Jim, right. Jim Fortune, right? In exactly, Kodak. one of my mentors. And, and the other person who I, 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 I look up very much is Erwin Kotler. So I learned a lot from that. I think whatever do we do is always the people we help who have to come first. They have to be seen, they have to be heard, they have to be empowered to speak out and speak up and to show their, uh, you know, show their faith. This taboo. Your screen's freezing up a little bit. I don't know if that's at your end or at our end. Go, go ahead. It must be the, the weather, but I think part of it is basically to give the human face to the people and to the problem that we're trying to address. And more importantly, you know, when we go public and we work with our clients and people whom we organize, basically is to create n numbers, to create the narratives, to s tell to the, these people whom we, we help and to others that you are not alone. And this is one of the lessons I learned when I was young, in my younger days, I, I, I work on the issue of domestic violence. But you know, in those days, women who were beaten up by the abusive spouse, the marching order was scream quietly or your neighbors will hear. No, we have to break the silence. We have to go forward and we have to say that, look, there are people who suffer and these are the reasons why they suffer and these are the reasons why our public institutions have to recognize. Again, I go back to the issue of racial profiling, that racial profiling hurts, it, basic, it can kill, and that together, regardless of racial background, we, together we have to come together, you know, come together and create a movement for change so that nobody can have their life, right to life, liberty and security person uh, jeopardized uh, because of racism. Boniemi, many thanks, my friend. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your service to this community. And as I said, if you and CRAR didn't exist, we'd have to, uh, we'd have to invent it. Truly a unique organization. To those of you out there, to, to you students, you couldn't enter it anywhere better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure. Have a you nice too. day. Take care, folks.